you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. In June 1977, two Air Force EMTs decided to take their first camping trip in the Devil's Den State Park, Arkansas. What was supposed to be a fun trip for two best friends turned into a terrifying night that changed their lives forever. For this week's Mysteries and Monsters, I'm joined by author and experiencer Terry Lovelace to discuss that night in Devil's Den and the physical, personal and emotional ramifications that still linger to this day. Terry talks us through the build-up to the event, the immediate aftermath and the myriad of weirdness that occurred after that night. From overly interested military personnel to mysterious nurses, strange medication and an FBI agent who clearly knew more than he was prepared to say. Terry takes us through just what happened to himself and the sad decline of his best friend Toby, both forever changed by those few hours that night. It's a compelling and emotional account, and it was a pleasure to speak with Terry about this harrowing ordeal. I think you'll agree that often we don't consider the emotional and psychological effects that such events can have on the participants. Thank you to Terry for being so open and honest in our conversation for you today. Before we get there, as always, you can support the show on Patreon by clicking the link in the show notes for early release of the episodes, bonus content and other fun surprises. The link is in this week's show notes and it's $4 a month. You can also find Mysteries and Monsters across all social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and our website is mysteriesandmonsters.com. As always, artwork for the show is by Dean Bestall. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of The Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be part of the Straight Up Strange Network. Now, let's join Terry as he takes us back to one fateful night in this area that has a history of unusual events. In June 1977, A decision to go camping in the Devil's Den National Park would change Terry Lovelace's life forever. What happened that night has seen Terry question everything he knew, and with two fantastic books under his belt, I am delighted to welcome him to Mysteries and Monsters. Terry, delighted to welcome you to the show, sir. Thank you so much, Paul. It's a great pleasure to be here. Well, thank you for joining me. I know uh, we had to rearrange it at short notice, but thank you for being as flexible as as needed to be. But uh, what can we do with the weathers like it is? Well, I appreciate your patience. Thank you so much. As we were chatting off air, Terry, I was was saying you're a gentleman I've been aware of for for two or three years, um, primarily after your first book, Incident at Devil's Den, came out, I think, uh, well, three years ago this month, I think it was, was it 2018, March? Yes, March 2018. It's about on. Yeah. So it's always been a very interesting subject for me in regards to experiences like this. Terry, I've had the pleasure of speaking with two or three people with very similar stories from around the world. And I'm often taken aback by the real sort of emotional change that people go through. Because up until this evening in 1977, when you you went camping... You'd had a pretty normal life, it would seem, on on first glances. You had joined the army. You were an EMT, working there so you could get your degree, I believe, so you could further yourself out of out of the forces once you'd finished. Yes. And so life was just sort of moving along in in quite a positive fashion for you, wasn't it? Absolutely. Uh, it, it, it was. And, you know, I should mention, I did have some experiences as a, as a child, but, uh, you know, for the most part, my uh, my childhood was pretty normal. Yeah. It's often very interesting. I think sometimes, Terry, it takes an event like this that occurs as an adult for you to sometimes look backwards and think, was there more to it? Because one of the things that's always struck me about your 
experience with your your friend at the time is that I've always been struck by the undercurrent of the emotional situation that that changed everything after this and I've often found that when I've spoken with people who have had similar similar experiences and and gone through life-changing events such as yourself Terry I think sometimes we it's easy to forget the real emotional changes that someone has to go through when they've experienced something that essentially turns their life upside down overnight. You know, that's that's very true. Uh, 1977, June of 1977 was a watershed moment for me, so much so that I, I tend to measure my life in pre-1977 and post-1977 terms. It was, you know, my friend uh, Toby and I went down to Devil's Den, kind of carefree and uh I was 22 years old at the time. Uh, Toby was 23. And, uh, you know, we, I think we went down there as, as uh, you know, maybe late adolescent kids almost, you know, kind of a carefree attitude. And, you know, we, we trespassed into a part of the park that we assumed was some kind of nature preserve or something. And we, we didn't intend to, to, you know, set the place ablaze or, or, or leave our trash behind. We tended to treat it with courtesy. But we knew we were trespassing. We assumed the worst they would do was throw us out. And, uh, you know, we we had our event and we left there changed people, uh, you know, and it changed the nature of our relationship uh, with one another. We had worked together for three years uh, on the night shift. And, you know, you work at night with someone, you know, sometimes you're drastically busy. A lot of times you're just sitting around all evening as a first responder. Unless something happens, there's nothing to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, you get to know your your uh, your coworker pretty well. Mm-hmm. And uh, we we were best of friends. We uh, our wives were friends. We were both married, living on on the base and in CO housing. And uh, you know, just. Uh, for the time and place and, the, and where we were at our situation, we were, we were perfectly happy. And um, it did. You used the correct term. It turned our world upside down. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting when you talk about that period that precedes it, Terry, in regards to your relationship with Toby. And um, I, I, I chuckled about the fact that you were you were almost like opposites attack, attract when you were talking about the kind of music you like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Toby was more of a soul brother. He preferred yes. his, uh, you know, he liked Stevie Wonder and the Commodores, which is, uh, sure. I think, to be honest, both of you have got excellent taste in music, to be honest. <laughs> and and like you say, he seemed a very down-to-earth chap. He was quite studious, as you both were. Toby had a had a real love of astronomy and, and one of the things I know you've mentioned in it is when you were quiet, you would discuss the night sky and he would point out constellations and you would just discuss things and, and do what best friends do. You, you just chew the fat, don't you? Absolutely. And, you know, it was an opportunity lost that I never had the presence of mind to ask him where his fascination with the night sky originated. What's the genesis behind that fascination? I, 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 I'd love to know. I, I suspect I know. Mm. It would be interesting because clearly he'd got a pathway because as I touched on, in the beginning of the conversation, Terry, was Toby doing the same kind of thing that you were basically using your your forces time to to get this degree and get yourself forward in life? Was Toby doing the same kind of thing that you were planning? Because I know you were you were working on your law degree, were you? Yes. Well, I was working on my undergraduate degree. I needed a four year degree uh, before I could even apply to law school. Mm. So um, he was he was working toward uh, he was a mathematician. Where I, I am not. I'm a wordsmith, but I'm 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 no good with numbers. Uh, and his forte was was uh, math equations. And he uh, there was an extension university on base where we could take a few classes. And uh, he took all the physics and calculus classes available and aced them all. He was just a wizard with math. So yeah, he was there like me. We were both there for the uh, GI Bill that would pay for our college education once we finished our, our commitment to the military. Uh, so that was our ticket to to, um, to, to college because we came from – our parents didn't really have the wherewithal to, to send us to university. So, mm. you know, this was this was a, an option for us. Yeah, yeah, means to an end. Absolutely. What also strikes me about this is when you've spoken about this kind of build-up, it, it's quite 
comical really that yourself and Toby I think Toby comes up with this plan that the best thing you can do on a break is, is go camping despite the fact that neither of you had ever done this before or, or, or shown any real inclination into getting into the uh, the great beyond yeah. as it were Terry so I found it very interesting that when you've discussed this build up to the trip it seems very odd because I know you refer to the fact that you know, you're you're both forces men. You know about planning, packing your kit, being prepared. You've got to be ready for any eventuality when you when you work in the air force, uh, especially in the roles that you did, Terry. And I was very struck by the fact that preparing for this, and when it's only when you actually get down to Devil's Den after your your arduous what was it six and a half hour trip, I believe it was. Correct. Yes. Um that both of you seem to have just forgotten the kind of the way you would plan things in in preparation for any kind of eventuality terry and and you seem to both turn up there questioning what on earth you've done it's it's almost as if someone else has prepared your kits for you you know in in, in retrospect i can see just an awful lot of things that, that that don't make sense and and you're right we weren't nearly that inept i mean we were we were um we were well prepared. I mean, camping is not rocket science. It's, it's, mm. uh, we planned everything perfectly, but fell down on the execution of it. You know, we, we left things at home that we had prepared to take with us. Uh, the whole purpose of the exercise for me was to take photographs of wildlife because mm. uh, I had a nice camera. I had a little dark room set up in my, uh, in my home, but we lived on a nuclear base. And there's not much you can do with a camera when you live on a nuclear base. So yes. <laughs> we needed to get somewhere. I wanted to photograph wildlife. So that was the, the interest that I had. And Toby, of course, wanted to watch the night sky without any light pollution and, uh, you know, on a just beautiful plateau that we that he knew of. Hmm. Uh, but, yeah, in retrospect, we, we forgot so many things that, that – we intentionally should have taken and it just seems like a series of missteps that were just out of character for us mm. Mm. but you know when we got down there uh it was interesting that someone from a follower on facebook obtained the uh, google maps and he charted the pathway that we would have had taken to get to this plateau it would have involved something like 20 turns left and right and any misstep along that way the route would have taken us you know, in circles, and we would maybe we couldn't see this plateau where we camp because the the summit, the top of this plateau, was absolutely level with the treetops. Mm. So unless you're right upon the thing, you can't you can't see it. Uh, but boy, Toby navigated us there like he knew where he was going, and that puzzles me to this day. Mm. It it almost seems as if it was predestined, Terry. Now you may disagree with that, but. There's a lot of this. None of it seems to make sense. Um, like I say, from from Toby's suggestion out of the blue, really, to go camping, from the fact that you go somewhere that I believe you even go past national parks to get to the Devil's Den from where you you guys were based, um, oh. which is unusual as well. To get there and discover that you know, for, for example, I mean, your plan was to go there and do photography, and yet you'd forgotten your camera, which. Is, is baffling, I would imagine, even more so for yourself. Toby had also forgotten some things. I know he'd not packed enough beer, um, <laughs> though, right. he, though he wasn't a big drinker, so he wasn't sort of, you know, he hadn't sort of forgotten to bring a case. He'd just only packed a few, which didn't seem to be uh, too much of a problem. But things like food and tin openers and, and things you would consider essentials, it's almost as if it didn't really matter what you what you took with you because what you thought you were going to do wasn't the reason you had to be there. It felt like um, it felt like we were keeping an appointment. It, it really did. And, and, and I, I believe that we had an appointment there. We were right on time. It, it strikes me when I when I've read what the build up to this was, because despite all these setbacks and uh, and as you may say, schoolboy errors, as it were, Terry, that you, <laughs> you know, as you, as you refer to, you were nowhere near that inept. Um, <laughs> it. You still made the best of it, you know, sharing hot dogs and, and a bag of chips and enjoy, enjoying the surroundings. I mean, I've seen the, the area. It is a stunning plateau because it's, it, it's a very strange area as well because it's almost like a just a great big triangular meadow 
just sitting above the treetops. Well, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. I uh, I posted those images from Google Earth on my Facebook page, and I have a friend down in Alabama who owns a landscape company, and he reached out to me and said, "Look, I can I can blow this up on my big monitor," and he says, uh, "and this is a Google Earth image that's just a couple years old," and he says, "I can clearly see tractor marks." where what he said that there was a, a farm tractor that would pull behind it what's called a brush hog, which is a, a platform with grass cutting uh, blades underneath it. And that's that's how they kept the thing mowed. You know, when I first wrote the book, I didn't even bother to look for the place mm-hmm. because my I mean, it made sense that it would have been covered with 40 year old mature trees by now. Yeah. And it should be. But it's not. Mm. Uh, but the land is owned by the Bureau of Land Management, leased to some third party. But why would the Bureau, why would the U.S. government pay to cut the top of this plateau in a remote area in the middle of nowhere? Mm. It makes no sense. And they've been doing it for 50 years. Yeah. It is visually striking because it's it's so clear. It's it's remarkable. And like you say, it it is questionable as to why anybody would decide what makes that particular area so special that it has to be maintained in such a way, Terry? Yes. So you're there. You've had your you've had your hot dogs and your chips. You and Toby and you and you looking at the night sky. And did you did Toby notice the lights before the before you realised that the area had gone silent, or was it the silence that sort of was the precursor to the lights' arrival, Terry? The silence was the precursor, and I had never experienced that before. Of course, I had no experience with the outdoors to speak of, but Mm. we were talking. uh, We had inflatable air mattresses with a campfire between us, and we were talking back and forth, and and the noises from the forest, the the crickets, the tree frogs and the like, made so much noise that, you know, we had to raise our voices a little bit to be heard by one another. And, uh, and that was okay. It was, it was, you know, part of the ambiance of the, of the setting. <laughs> and then it stopped. And I noticed that it stopped. And not only did the noises of the forest stop, but even the gentle breeze that we'd enjoyed, because it was kind of a warm, you know, June day, uh, the breeze had stopped. And it was, it was dead quiet. I mean, it was as if we were in a sound booth quiet. And I, I asked my, because it unnerved me. The, the abruptness of it. And I asked my friend, you know, like he's going to know, right? He, he would have no idea. But I asked him anyway, Toby, is this, does this seem right to you? It's awfully quiet out here. And he just kind of blew it off and said, yeah, don't worry about the bugs. They'll come back and make noise. He says, we've been laughing and, and cutting up and, you know, we've probably quieted them and, and they'll be back. Hmm. Um, but, you know, I was unnerved by the whole thing. And had I been there by myself, I'd have left then. Hmm. Um, but, you know, I, I thought, uh, you know, I'll stick it out. Maybe Toby's right. And then uh, we're having a, just a bit of conversation, just a few minutes of conversation. And that's when he turned his head toward the left and became fixated on something. And before I could ask him, hey, what are you looking at? He asked me, hey, Terry, were those lights there before? And I knew there were no lights anywhere. We were in a remote area. We could see on the uh, eastern horizon a very dim glow of the small campgrounds that were there. Hmm. Uh, But they were some miles away. Uh, And there was nothing else around there. It was just we were in the wilderness. Uh, So I I couldn't see. Actually, his torso was in my line of sight. I had to stand up to see it. And um, um, I saw these three cluster of three little stars, uh, each one about as bright as the North Star, and they sat on the western horizon, uh, but they were far enough above the horizon that they weren't lights from a parking lot or a train or something like that. Um, but it's, it seemed like they, sh- they could have been lights from maybe an aircraft that was headed directly in our direction hmm. and then gave the illusion that it wasn't moving. And uh, I kind of thought, well, we'll watch it for a minute or two, and it'll change direction by a degree or so, and then we'll we'll see the motion. Hmm. Uh, but that didn't happen. And we're looking at this thing, and um, it just looked artificial. It looked out of place. And then it rotated. The All three stars 
maintained perfect alignment in a triangle, but the, it rotated like it were on an axis. And it turned about 120 degrees and aligned itself with the base of the triangle parallel with the horizon. So the apex of the triangle pointed up. And while we're watching this thing, um, just a second or two later, it started to climb up into the sky. And the second that it did, I felt a, um, a wave of calm wash over me. And the best way I can describe it is mild sedation. I felt um, um, also this, this kind of, I was in a strange place. I felt kind of detached, disassociated, disinterested almost. I wouldn't say I was apathetic, mm. uh, but I felt more like an observer than I was a participant in this event. Yeah. And all that fear and anxiety that I had earlier when when the forest fell quiet, that was all gone. And I just felt uh, a calm. And my friend was in the same, same frame of mind. There were barely, you know, a word spoken between us. I think he said something to the effect of, man, they're really moving now, you know, in reference to the stars. I don't recall answering him, but I think that's about the only conversation that we had. And we watched this thing climb until it reached uh, an altitude of, I'm guessing, 10,000, 15,000 feet. There's no, I had no point of reference. Hmm. Uh, but it reached the ceiling and then kind of leveled out. And then the apex of the triangle tilted down directly at us. And it started like a glide plane type descent. And it was apparent that, uh, well, a couple things. It was apparent that it was one solid object and not three objects moving in, in unison. Hmm. Um, because the area between the points of light was pitch black and the sky it was a beautiful night. There were a trillion stars out the sky from the, from the uh, starlight. There was just a, a blue tint to the sky and the interior of this triangle was black. And as it descends, it continues, you know, to grow uh, and get larger. And it did this somersault type thing where the tip of the uh, triangle turned underneath, and then the two lights in the back came around. It did a somersault of sorts. And um, I had the odd thought. I thought it's doing this. It's a message to us. It's mm. telling us it's moving with purpose. It's not out of control. Mm. It's not, uh, you know, having some kind of, uh, of flight emergency. That's It's doing what it intends to do. It's moving with purpose. Um. And again, no fear, no anxiety, just um, just watching this thing play out. And it came in over the forest at about 5,000 feet uh, on the horizon and then continued to descend to about 3,000 feet. And it came to a, to a halt directly over uh, that meadow. And it, it filled that entire meadow. As a matter of fact, in, in my book, I describe it, and I think it's accurate, as being a city block long on each leg of the triangle. Mm. So it was absolutely enormous. And we were fortunate enough. It was, as a matter of fact, it was Toby's idea that we camp. I wanted to camp in the middle of the meadow. And he was really insistent that we camp back by the, the, the edge of the cliff, by the tree line. And I'm glad that, that I that I acquiesced and, you know, gave in. <laughs> Had we been in the middle of that metal, this thing would have been directly over our heads. And as it was, we were kind of offset. Yeah. And, and the advantage was, too, that that gave us a clear view of the side of the thing. Uh, so we could see one side uh, pretty clearly. Um, the lights on the points of the triangle had dimmed somewhat, but we still um, – well, when it was 3,000 feet in the air, we, we could only see the underside. And on the underside, from the from dead center underneath, um, there came a light uh, that was just like someone turned a switch on, and there was a, a beam of white light, and it was a it was a visible white light. It had that quality of like a like a high power search light that cuts through fog. You mm. can see a whole column of light. Yeah. Of course, there was no fog, uh, but the, the, the light was visible, and it landed right in our campfire. And we could trace it, trace it visually all the way up, uh, you know, the 3,000 feet or so to the to the source. 
um, then it was bright and it stayed there for maybe 60 seconds. And then again, it just, as if someone hit the switch, it turned off. Uh, but immediately in its stead, there came a, a laser beam from the same spot. And this was a laser beam about the diameter of a pencil. Uh, and it, uh, 1977, I'd seen lasers on television, but I'd never seen one in real life before, but mm. I, I recognized it for what it was. And it would land in our, in our campsite at one spot for maybe a tenth of a second and then reappear in another spot. So that in 10 times a second, it would dance all over our campsite. And it struck me in the chest a couple of times. I never felt a thing. And it seemed focused on us and the things that we brought with us. So my car, uh, my friend Toby had a backpack sitting next to him. Hmm. Uh, It struck Toby a number of times. It struck our tent. Um, And, you know, I, I had the feeling, you know, this thing is checking us out. It's scanning us. Hmm. And I, and I believe that's accurate. And that lasted for maybe two or three minutes. And then that shut off. And again, still no, no anxiety, no fear between us. Um, but what happened was that, that mild sedation that we both felt, as soon as that light turned off, it transitioned to, um, all I wanted to do was put my head down and go to sleep. Hmm. You know, and I think that speaks to the level of influence that these things have over us. You know, we were two guys that worked the night shift. I mean, this was mid afternoon for us. We yes. should not, we should not have been sleepy. Yeah. Tired, maybe, mm. but we had no, no reason to be sleepy whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, but we did. We, my friend stood up and he said, show's over, which I thought was kind of an odd thing to say. Mm. And he grabbed his air mattress and he went over to our little, you know, $9 Kmart tent and tossed his air mattress in and fell on top of it. And I followed suit and I didn't bother to take off my T-shirt or my boots. I just um, fell on top of the air mattress and I was out the second my head hit that air mattress. And my last thought being that, you know, you were wrong, Toby, because the crickets, the tree frogs, that stuff didn't come back. It was still still quiet outside, but, uh, <laughs> but, but no anxiety about it. I, I, I just, uh, I think I, I, it's more accurate to say that I lost consciousness, that I went to sleep. The whole scenario, Terry, is strange because even if you were being buzzed by a helicopter or, or a light aeroplane, you would find that peculiar, maybe even worrying, wouldn't you? And to, to be faced by some enormous object that seems to be, as you say, checking you out. It's almost as if it was trying to get a grid reference for everything that was in your vicinity. Um, Correct. And to be so calm about it all. And the thing that's always struck me when I've I've heard you discuss this is Toby's response to it by saying, show's over. I mean, there just doesn't seem to be any relevance to that. And then to be able to just sort of, as you say, you both collapse lose consciousness rather than fall asleep it, yes the, it's just very weird and yet you've still got this complete silence because i know you've never mentioned this this craft was making any noise at all either which is even more unusual when you think that all the ambient noise that you've mentioned the crickets and the the frogs and the animals of the forest the noise of nature had disappeared gone you were you were basically as if you were inside some kind of a vacuum terry you know, it, it had the feel, it had an artificial vibe to it, if, mm. if that makes sense. I recall that um, when things first saw, fell silent, I noticed that the breeze had gone because our campfire uh, wasn't dancing around in the in the breeze anymore. It was just burning mm. straight up. Yeah. And there was a large tree directly in back of our tent that we could see. And I recall looking at the leaves thinking, you know, this – even though there's not much of a breeze, there should be some movement within this tree. Mm. And and I never saw a thing. I never saw a thing move. And it struck me as as, as artificial. It's the only uh, explanation I could give for it. So, eventually, you come round, Terry. Was it still dark at this point? I mean, obviously, it's June, so you would... Night is, is, is at a premium during this time of the year, obviously, because of the... Um, the time of year. So was it still dark when you sort of regained your senses and came round? 
It, it was. Um, I should note that we both wore mechanical wind-up watches, which mm. was the standard of the day, and they were integral to our job as EMTs, so we needed them. And uh, both of our watches had stopped at 2.40. Mine stopped at 2.40. Toby stopped at 2.41. And uh, they, those watches never worked again. Uh, my watch was relatively new. My wife had bought it for me eight months earlier, and uh, it was still under warranty. Mm. And it was an Elgin watch. I sent it back. I returned it to the Elgin watch company, and I complained that it stopped working. They returned it to me and said that I had voided the warranty by being around a, ma- source of magne- a large magnetic source of some kind, like industrial machinery or something. Ah. And I thought that was curious. And my God, I wish I'd saved that letter. I wish I'd saved the watch. Yeah. But of course, at the time, I had other things on my mind. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, hindsight, just, hindsight is a wonderful thing, Terry. It is indeed. Yes. <laughs> so, was Toby looking out of the tent when you came round, or, or were you both sort of simultaneously recovering at the same time? So, did you spot Toby? Because I, I believe Toby's seemed to be watching it, whatever was going on outside. So Yeah, Toby, yeah exactly. Toby was ahead of me. Uh, he was awake before I was. Mm. I woke up because there were these flashing lights that were yellow, maybe light greenish and white. Uh, they were not in any kind of sequence, and they were incredibly bright. They were, um, they were bright in the way that they were similar to like an old school, maybe 1960s or 70s flash bulb camera that had those large multi-filament bulbs that would flash. And then you'd see the blue dot in front of your eye when you blinked for the next hour. Yeah. Uh, they were that intensity. Mm. And I woke up and I didn't have my wits about me. And I'm, I'm sitting up and I realize that I'm in pain. I'm also realized that now I can hear a noise. Uh, this thing, it, there was no, it wasn't silent anymore. I heard this drone, I call it a droning noise. I, ha- I, I heard this low pitched, almost mechanical kind of noise. And it was the kind of noise you'd hear if you were standing next to maybe like a, a diesel locomotive that were idling or a big piece of industrial machinery, that kind of thing. Mm. And, uh, but it wasn't loud. It wasn't loud, but it was powerful. You could feel it in your chest. Yeah. So I'm confused. I'm trying to make sense of all this. And I'm thinking, you know, this, I bet this is a park ranger's truck. And what I'm seeing are the flashing overhead lights of a, um, of a park ranger's truck there to kick us out of the park. Yeah. Um, and, uh, that's what woke me up was, were the, were these lights. And I sat up and I noticed that my boots had been unlaced. Mm. And that really confused me because I, I would not have gone to sleep with my boots unlaced like that. I mean, if you had to take off and run somewhere, it's a trip hazard. I would have taken my boots off. I would have left them laced up, but I would not have done that. Mm. Uh, so I took them off and, uh, you know, my socks were on sideways and the, the military teaches you to take care of your feet because if you can't walk, you're not much good. So, yeah, uh, I was annoyed at that and, uh, but I didn't understand it. So I, I took my socks off, put them on properly, put my boots on, laced them up properly. And then I turned my attention to my friend. Uh, and he is, as you said, he's on his knees uh, to my left, peeking out of the flap of the tent. And in one of these flashes of light, I could see tracks of tears down his face. And Toby was uh, African-American, so he had dark skin, and the saline in his tears uh, illuminated during a flash of white light, and I could see a white streak down the side of his face mm. and realize he'd been crying. And that... Uh, I wasn't in a full blown panic yet, but that, that disturbed me because I could not imagine what would make this man cry. And I, I sat up and I asked him, I said, Toby, man, what is it? Is it park rangers? Who's out there? And, uh, he was, he was trembling. He was afraid and he put his fingers across his lips and he said, shh, be quiet. They're still out there. And and I'm I'm not frightened, but I'm annoyed. And I'm like, Toby, who is still out there? And um, I pulled the I got on my knees and I went to my my side of the tent and I pulled the flap back just a couple inches and I looked out 
And I saw two things. I saw that this thing that had been 3,000 feet over the meadow when we went to bed had descended. Hmm. And it's now parked just 30 feet above the meadow. Hmm. And it filled that entire meadow. And its size was very intimidating because it was, it was right on, it wasn't right on top of us, but it was, it was right next to us. Um, and the second thing that I saw was, um, it was very dark underneath this thing, but in the flashes of light, uh, that were emitted from the points of the triangle, um, and if anyone would like to see a drawing of that, uh, they could go to terrylovelace.com and there's a picture uh, that I drew that's contemporaneous with the event. It was drawn in August of 1977. Hmm. And in these flashes of light, I saw underneath what looked to be about a dozen. I didn't count them. I wish I had uh, a dozen or maybe 15 what I, th- what I thought were children hmm. uh, walking around, just meandering around this meadow. And I'm confused. And I said to Toby, I said, man, what are these what are these little kids doing out here in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere? Hmm. It didn't make sense. And he said, take a look at them, Terry. He says, they're not human beings. He said, don't you remember? They took us and they hurt us. And as soon as he said that, I had uh, some mental imagery of being inside this thing. And uh, I knew that we were involved with with non-human entities. And that's when my fear went from, you know, neutral to right through the roof. I was just absolutely terrified. And I was scared to death that we were going to cough or sneeze or one of us was going to make a noise and draw their attention and they'd come over uh, mm. to the tent. We didn't know. We had no way to know that they were already done with us. <laughs> you know, they had they'd already been long done with us and, and dumped us out of that thing. I might mention that they looked, uh, and I couldn't see them, very clearly, because there was a fair amount of distance, and I could only see them when the when the lights would flash. But they were gray in color, uh, and I couldn't tell if that was their their skin all over, or if they were wearing gray garments of some kind. I, I really couldn't tell. Um, but the two things that were most distinctive was the that their heads were too large for their the spindly bodies, hmm. uh, very much like you see in the motion pictures. Uh, and the second thing was they walked with a really peculiar gait. Um, they walked like their like their knees were hinged to go backward an inch or two with every step. Hmm. So it was an awkward kind of dragging their foot behind them kind of uh, um, gait. It was just unusual. And as we watched, there there came another light from the underneath of this thing in dead center. And this was another visible white light, but it was a it was a broad column of white light about about 30 feet in diameter. It was about as, as broad as this thing was tall off off the metal floor. Hmm. So about 30 feet in diameter. It appeared to be a, a perfect column. And as soon as that clicked on, these little guys all turned their attention in that direction. And they didn't run or hurry, uh, but they started to make their way toward this light. And when they would get to the light, they would step in in twos and threes, uh, one set at a time. And once inside, over about 20, 25 seconds, they would just pixelate out and be gone. And um, that was that was amazing. That was amazing more than frightening. Uh And we watched until uh, until the last two were gone. And uh, then this thing, um, that droning noise that I mentioned earlier, abruptly stopped. Yeah. The white light turned off and the lights on the points of the triangle changed from multicolored to just white. Hmm. I use a description that this thing was deep. It wasn't just a st- one story tall. It was five stories tall. Hmm. And th- there was on each point of the triangle, what I call a light bar. There was this um, this beam of white light that would run up and down that um, that light bar, as I called it. And I reasoned that, you know, this is what gives the appearance of a twinkling star when it's in the sky. Hmm. And I think that I think that's right. And we watched it take off and it just it lifted off like a hot air balloon. You know, it didn't take off like a rocket ship. Paul. it just lifted off. We sat there like two scared kids. Uh, I wanted to stay in the tent until morning. 
And of course, we had no idea what time it was. We knew it was at least 2.40. Yeah. Uh, but my friend said, no, let's get out of here. And I was apprehensive. And, you know, to this day, I will not walk across an open field. Uh, I will walk a mile and a half around if I have to, uh, rather than cut across. I feel vulnerable. Mm. And that's the way I felt that night. All I had over me was a piece of canvas, but it gave me cover. I was hidden. Yeah. And, you know, to make the dash to the car, I'd have to be vulnerable. Mm. But he convinced me that he could he could he could maneuver us out of there. And he did. Um, and we made a dash for the car and got out of there. We left everything behind. We left, uh, you know, Toby left his backpack that had his phone number and address in it on the base. Mm. Uh, I also had Toby, I forgot to mention Toby had a camera of his own that he brought from the great camera, but it was a camera. Mm. Uh, in his backpack. And you know, the thought of taking a picture of this thing never crossed my mind or Toby's. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that speaks to the level of influence that these things have over us. Because if you've ever known anyone who was an avid photographer, you know that they're to the point of being annoying, wanting to take a picture of everything. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You've got to document everything, Terry. Absolutely. I was one of those. <laughs> and uh, it never crossed my mind. Mm. Well, you get back to the car. Which is which isn't that far away, but obviously because of as you refer to it there, Terry, you're both deeply shaken by what's what's gone on. You're not really sure what's happened. You just know something's happened. And um, yes, and I remember hearing you say that obviously you'd got to get back. So we're talking a another long journey ahead of you. You're both beginning to realise that you're you're in a great deal of pain. Um, you're both incredibly thirsty, I believe. You're suffering. Clearly, you were suffering from dehydration, as, as, as becomes apparent, Terry, um, yes. after the event. How long were you driving? Because I know you stopped off at a service station, didn't you, to get yourself some liquids because you were both just desperately thirsty. We, we did. And, you know, the area is 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 crowded now. I mean, it's very built up. There's a, there's a lot of a uh, lot of businesses uh, mm. along along the route. But back then. You know, we were passing, uh, you know, mountains and, uh, trees. And then when we got out of the, when we got out of the, uh, Ozark mountainous area to, on our trip, we got, we ran into farmland. Hmm. Uh, and we drove, uh, I don't remember how long, hour and a half, maybe two hours. Uh, and it was just breaking dawn when we found a place that was open, just a little place for, for locals. And we pulled in and that's when I, I ran to the men's room. And, I, and I'm I'm in there and I'm just uh, drinking from this grungy faucet. I'm drinking cut hands full of water yeah. uh, until I can hold no more. And I, I looked in the mirror and I saw that I was beat red, uh, like I had terrible sunburn. Mm. And my hands were red. Uh, and even my palms were red. And I pulled up my T-shirt and under my arms were burned. I was burned everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And that made no sense to me. I never took my shirt off. Uh, we had sunscreen. Uh, we never laid out in, in the sun. Uh, we should not have been burned. No, Toby, of course, didn't have a sunburn, but he was burned nonetheless. And he was in, he was in a lot of pain. Um, and I maintained that whatever they did to me, they gave him a double dose because he could, he could not drive a car. Yeah. And that's when I noticed the, uh, with the sun coming up that I had the burns to my eyes. Mm. Uh, the doctors call it flash burns. Yeah. The, like the guys that do arc welding, mm. who wear that that hood with the uh, with the tinted glass mm. to keep their eyes from being burned, and that's what we had. Was essentially a sunburn to the cornea of your eye. Mm. It's very painful. It feels like you have sand in your eyes, yeah. and the sunshine just aggravates it. So that was the condition we were in, and we bought. Uh, I bought uh, six uh, cans of uh, orange uh, soft drink, and my uh, my friend bought a gallon of some kind of grape drink in a gallon container. And we hopped in the car, and we just wanted to get home, and we we drank everything. But you know, I the only conversation that we had for these six and a half hours, seven hours maybe, the only conversation that we had was we made a pact, we made an agreement that we would not tell a soul that we saw this um, this craft. Hmm. 
um, because we knew uh, 1977 was a different time. We knew that we'd be both sent for a psychological evaluation. Yeah. And uh, that would not have turned out well. No, so no. We we, uh, we made a promise that we would not divulge that information. Were you were you battling with these emotions that you've you've mentioned, Terry, in regards to? For some reason, you'd gone from thinking this guy was your best friend, somebody that you socialised with. Your wives were friends. You spent a lot of time together. You didn't want to be in his company anymore. You didn't want to be with him. Was this going on on the journey on the way home as well, we, that you were fighting these feelings? It, it was. They, they were, you know, they were thoughts I just I couldn't reconcile. I couldn't reconcile them then. I can't reconcile them today. Mm. But there was a distinct change. Uh, I, I didn't want anything to do with the guy. I mean, I didn't hate him. I didn't dislike him. I just didn't want to be in his company. And I don't understand that. And that persisted. Now, when we got back to the base, they examined us separately in separate treatment rooms. And we were both members of the hospital squadron. So these were all our friends. You know, we knew all the doctors, the nurses, everybody there. And all the hospital knew that, that Toby and Terry were making a camping trip, right? Mm. It was common knowledge. You know, the doctor's examining my sunburn. And he's like, you know, did, didn't you guys put on sunscreen? I'm like, you know, doc, we weren't out in the sun. Yeah. And he's, you know, he's looking into my arms as well as my feet. He says, how did you get burned all over your body? And I said, I, I don't know, sir. And, and, I, and I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't think it was sunshine. I know that. Mm. It was something else. And never peeled. I never blistered. But it hurt just like a bad sunburn. Yeah. So when, obviously, how long, I know, did you spend, was it three days you were you were in the hospital? Was it Terry? Yes. Yes, they hospitalized us. You know what they did was they busted us up. Yeah. They put us in, in separate rooms. And the um, as, as the doctor finished my examination, there were four gentlemen who walked into the room. It was the base commander who I've seen but didn't know, of course. There was the hospital commander, commander who I knew very well, uh, who was a very decent man. And then two guys in civilian, casual civilian clothing I did not recognize. Hmm. And the four of them walked in, and the only one that spoke was the hospital commander. And he said to me, Sergeant Lovelace, you're to have no contact with Sergeant Tobias in any way, shape, or form. That means no verbal conversations, no conversations by telephone. You're not to give him anything. He's not to give you anything. Uh, you're not to uh, arrange to communicate through third parties. You're not to write him a letter. Uh, if you're in the base exchange and you happen to run into him while you're shopping, you will immediately turn around and walk in the opposite direction. Mm. Uh, and just an odd, just an odd no contact order. Yeah. And he finished it up with, that's an order, Sergeant. And if you disobey that order, there'll be consequences. Do you understand me? Uh, and I said, yes, sir, I do. I mean, I, I, I didn't understand it. But of course, you know, I, at this point, I really didn't care to be in Toby's company anyway. So it, it didn't make a whole lot of difference. Hmm. So these these two strange gentlemen just never said a word to you, Terry. They were just sort of hanging around and, and just making sure that the other people, the other two people in the room were following one would presume what they'd been told to tell you. You know, I can make that assumption, but they never spoke. Uh, yeah. The base commander, the only one that spoke was the hospital commander. Hmm. You know, everyone had a serious look on their face. Hmm. I'll say that. Yeah. Uh, I, I was real quizzical. I mean, it was really, it, it, it didn't make sense to me uh, in one way, but I'll tell you, I was hurting. You know, they had IVs running in me to rehydrate me. Mm -hmm. uh, I was still feeling the effects of dehydration, so I really didn't, didn't much care. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. I did have an interesting experience in the hospital. Mm. And I had a visitor on my second night. I knew I was going to be going home the next day. Mm. And the night nurse, who I knew very well personally, came in to give me an injection about 9 o'clock at night, something to help me sleep and something for pain. And they kept the lights turned off in the room because I was still photophobic from that uh, injury to my eyes. As my night nurse came into the room, the one guy said there was a, a, an older guy, about 50, who was short in stature, and then a taller guy, mm. about six foot or so. And... Um, the shorter guy, the older guy, was in charge, and he did all the talking. And he said to the nurse, if that's going to sedate Sergeant Lovelace, it's going to have to wait. We need to ask him some questions. Mm -hmm. 
And then they pulled out their badges and they flashed their badges to her. Hmm. And then they showed them to me and identified themselves as being OSI, which stands for Office of Special Investigations. And in the United States Air Force, uh, they have a security police uh, that guard things and investigate things. And then within the security police, there's a special investigative branch. Hmm. And that's the Office of Special Investigation. And they tend to be plain, wear plain clothing and uh you know, they carry a badge. And I could tell that these guys were policemen. I mean, I I was a pretty straight kid. I'd never been in trouble in my life. But, you know, you I could just tell that these guys were cops. Mm. Uh, no, I mean, nobody else would be wearing a business suit with the, with the suit coat open and the shoulder holster visible. Yeah. Uh, and they were rude to the nurse, which I didn't understand. After he told her that I couldn't have an injection, and he, he said to her, and shut the door on your way out. And I didn't understand that lack of civility. That didn't make sense to me. Mm. Uh, and I assumed that anger was directed at me, maybe. Yeah. And I thought, oh, my God, what have we done? And the first thing that came to mind was, I bet we burned the forest down, maybe. <laughs> yeah. That was my first thought. Why else would they be there? Mm. Mm. And he sat down. He pulled up a chair and the one on either side of me. The uh, younger guy took notes. The older guy did most of the talking. He put on a pair of glasses, and he read me my rights under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the UCMJ, hmm. and asked me if I understood them. And I, I knew that I had the right to remain silent. But, you know, I, I I didn't have the benefit of life experience at age 22. I certainly didn't have the benefit of a law degree. Um, yeah. And I, I was under the mistaken belief that, you know, if, if I refuse to talk, that's going to make me look guilty. So I, I, I thought, you know, cooperation is the best thing I can do, mm. um, which I certainly wouldn't advise. But in that situation. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> very true. But that's that's what I did. And I said, uh, you know, I want to help any way I can. I don't know. What have we done? What, what What's the problem? And um, what they did was he said this. He said, that, you know, well, Sonny said, we found your little campsite. The park rangers found your little campsite uh, and your buddy's address was in the was in the backpack. So they called and got a hold of us and they found your uh, little campsite set up and they said, you left everything there, you know, your food, your water, uh, your tent, everything. It says, so the assumption is you were planning on coming back. And I said, no, sir, we never planned to come back. And he said, well, then explain to me why you left all your things down there. And I said, sir, and here's this is the story that Toby and I agreed upon because you know we wanted to be we wanted to be honest. I mean, uh, mm. we didn't want to tell a lie. That that was contrary to our nature, and we agreed that the story would be this. That, and this is true. We felt odd. We felt funny the night before. Went to bed and woke up sick as dogs. Yeah. And we just we just left out the part about seeing a, a UFO the size of a medical dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think he knew. Mm. Uh, and he went through this interrogation, I think, designed to intimidate me. Uh, I don't think it was designed to, to come up with any information. It was designed to intimidate me. And he succeeded beyond his wildest dreams because I was extremely intimidated. Yeah. And toward the end, he kind of, he wrapped up things and he, he put things away and the captain left and the nurse came in and I got my shot and then uh, she leaves and it's just me and this major. Uh, in the room and he bent over right next to my ear and he said he had this this accent uh american southern accent maybe alabama mississippi some one of those states yeah and he said son i know and you know you two knuckleheads stumbled onto something while you were out there and i think you know what i mean and i didn't i didn't answer him i didn't answer i didn't know how to answer Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, yeah, I know you know. And he said, all I want to know is how many pictures you took of him. And, you know, without thinking, yeah. I, I said, sir, I never took a single picture. And he just smiled because I just made an admission. Yeah. I just, I, I just made an admission. And then uh, he, he bent over and he said, I don't believe you. And uh, turned around and left. So they knew. I, I don't know how they knew. Uh, maybe the park rangers. I don't know. Hmm. But I know this, that I think because of my reputation of being a, a photographer, I think they were very concerned that I had a 36 exposure roll of film. Yeah. God, I wish I had. 
Well, I wish I had. Yeah. I had, I had sold that to the National Enquirer for a million million dollars. <laughs> yeah, very I'm true. Talking from my island home right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your your own Caribbean island, Terry. Yes. <laughs> so. What I found very interesting on top of this is is that obviously you get discharged, you, you've still not been able to or want to even see Toby, regardless, and you're prescribed these pills which don't really agree with you, but you seem to get this strange nurse that comes to visit you to make sure you're taking your, your prescription, it seems, Terry. Very odd, very odd situation. When I was discharged from the hospital on the third day, we were given 30 days off uh, duty because we were hurt. Before I give the bucket of pills story, I got to tell you, there was an elderly doctor, a full colonel, hmm. who walked in and sat down on the edge of my bed and said, well, you know, you're going to be going home today. And he said, well, we finally figured out what's wrong with you. And you know what happened was, he said, those, those, because we had laid down, it was a hot day, we'd taken a hike, hmm. actually. And uh, I don't have time to go through the whole thing, but... We had uh, laid down on this cool rock, a uh, limestone rock outcropping that was under a canopy of trees. We were in the shade, and the rock was cool to the touch. So we kind of uh, laid back on this thing, and uh, we ended up taking a nap, which I don't understand. <laughs> uh, an unscheduled nap. And I don't know what happened during that nap. I mean, one of these days I'll be regressed and find out, but... Um, he told us, he told me, this This doctor told me, he said, what happened was, he said, you laid, you laid down on some rocks that were radioactive. He said, naturally occurring uranium in, in, the, in the ground there and uh, on that ledge that where you guys took a nap. And he said, that's, that's what burns you guys. But he said, now listen, he says, you know, that's nobody's business. He said, uh, you, know, you, you, you know, you live and work on a nuclear base. You shouldn't be talking about that or anything radioactive. And... Um, he said, but it's it's all natural. There's a perfectly logical explanation for all of this. And uh, I said, yes, sir. And I'm thinking, do you think I'm born yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> How dumb do you think I am, doctor? Yeah, um, what a strange thing I didn't, to say. I didn't leave a moment of that. It's a strange thing to say, yeah. And I didn't, you know, I knew we laid down on limestone. I knew there wasn't radioactive limestone <laughs> anywhere down there. Yeah. It was insanity. And um, But that was their story. And they gave me these pills, a large bottle, a capsules, and I was supposed to take one a day, pardon me, three a day, one with each meal. Mm. I took them uh, the first the first day home. I took them, and then uh, we had dinner on 5.30 in the evening. I took the third one, and there was a knock at the door about 6.30 p.m., and uh, we weren't expecting anyone. And I opened the door, and here's a woman in a nursing uniform. And she said, Sergeant Lovelace, I said, yes. And she said, my name's Janet. I'm a nurse. I'm here to do your pill count. And I said, well, I don't know anything about that. And she said, yes. She said, it's normal. I, I, I need to see your medication bottle. And I just count your pills to make sure that you've taken them according with the doctor's direction. And I thought that was strange. Uh, now, this woman never took my blood pressure, never asked how I was feeling, mm. uh, never asked me a single question. Uh, she carried a chart with her and would make some notes. And she had, uh, oh, a little plastic tray like pharmacists use and a little blade thing where you can count out pills, slide them over, close a cylinder and dump them right back in the bottle. Mm -hmm. And she did her pill count and she'd make her notes and um, say, well, well, we'll see you tomorrow. And she'd leave. Yeah. And uh, I thought that was strange. And then about the third day, I'm feeling really after the first day, I'm feeling out of sorts. And mm. about the third day, I'm I'm not myself. Uh, I can't balance a checkbook. I can't do the routine household things I would normally do. Uh, I didn't finish a book I was in the middle of. I'm watching cartoons on television. Mm. And uh, my wife comes to me and she says, you know, I, I have to tell you something. And you got to trust me on this. These pills are making you stupid. Mm. And I said, you know, my wife is an observant woman, yeah. and uh, we hadn't been married all that long, but we knew each other a long time. And uh, I knew that if she said that, she wouldn't lie to me. So I said, okay, what do, what do we do? And she says, here's what they do. They count your pills. She said, with each meal, wait until after the meal, and then go flush one down the toilet. 
That way your pill count, if she should come early, will always be accurate. Mm. And I said, well, what if she asked to see me take a pill, which she never did, never had never done. Mm. She said, well, let's take it, put it between your cheek and your lips, take a sip of water um, and open your mouth. And I said, OK. Um, so I, that's what I did. And it was about four or five days later, I was pretty much back to myself. And I called, um, I refer to her as Nurse Brenda. She was a registered nurse at the hospital that I worked at, who I knew very well, who was friends with both my wife and I. And uh, I called her up and she was on, on a shift and I asked her on the phone, I said, uh, hey, Janet, uh, what, uh, what were these pills that they sent me home with? And she says, I don't know, Terry, they didn't come from our formulary, but you and Toby got the same thing. And I said, well, what? I need to talk. And she interrupted me and said, well, you know what? I'll, uh, I'm busy right now. If it's OK, I'll stop by and say hi, see how you're doing on the way home when I finish my shift. Hmm. And I knew immediately she was concerned that, you know, the OSI was looking at me and maybe they were listening on the phone. I heard yeah. that. So. I said, well, you know, I have, I usually have company come by about 6.30. And she said, oh, I understand. And I'll, I'll, I'll see you a little later. So she came by at 8 o'clock. And I promised her I'd have a cold beer for her, which I did. <laughs> and um, we sat down. She hugged me, hugged my wife. And we sat down. And she was concerned about how I was doing. And um, we had a talk. And uh, it was a, a bit awkward in that, you know, there is the, there was still in 1977, as there is today, that officer enlisted man distinction, uh, that class distinction, you know, she was a captain and I was, I was a sergeant, mm. but she was, she was just wonderfully kind to us and wonderfully candid. Mm. And she told me that those pills, whatever they are, came from right, right Patterson air force base. Mm. Um, and they weren't from our, they, they weren't in our formulary. Our formulary is a list of a hospital's medications that they carry. Yeah. There was no medication name on the bottle just instructions uh, on how to take them. Hmm. And the label was they had been relabeled to Whiteman Air Force Base Pharmacy. But she said that was their origin was Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. So hmm. uh, she said, I don't know what they are. And we told her that, hey, you know, they're making us stupid. And we told her the whole story yeah. that I just told you. And she says, well, I think that's smart. Yeah, I would encourage you to do that. Don't take them, you know. And, uh, and I didn't. But you know what I – just like the watch, I, I, I wish I'd saved just one of those pills. Mm. And I looked, I had a physician's desk reference. It's a, from 1975 edition, but it was reasonably current. Um, and it had, before the Internet, you could go to this uh, PDR, physician's desk reference, and they had full color plates of every pill and capsule manufactured by every pharmaceutical company in the world mm. was in this book. And I went and I compared this to all the photographs and I couldn't find it. And it wasn't in there. Hmm. So that told me that it was specially made by a pharmacist. Yeah. So uh, I didn't take them. And uh, within four or five days, I was feeling much better and much back to my old self. And I often wondered, you know, to all Toby's struggles and his misfortune, I wonder how much of that could be attributed to his taking, you know, all of those pills. Yeah, did he take the full 30 day? Was it a 30 day? Dosage you were given, Terry. I think it was twenty-eight. I think it was. Yeah. Uh, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost as if they were trying to just basically sedate you for for whatever reason. Maybe it was they were worried that you may start remembering something, or they wanted to keep you in a kind of fog, Terry. That maybe just to sort of keep you uh, malleable, as it were, whilst you were coming, whilst you were dealing with whatever had happened. Yes. Yes. And so. Obviously, we've still got this situation where you're not allowed to to speak or contact Toby at all. So, how long after all this craziness, after the you know the the immediate aftermath of the events, Terry? When did when did you decide you just couldn't deal with this anymore and you needed to find out what was going on? Uh, we were coming home from the base grocery store, and my wife was driving. It was her car, and I asked her. I said, because you know what, I didn't. Well, I didn't want to hang out with Toby, you know, our friendship had changed. Mm. Um, but I felt that the right thing to do, the civil thing to do, would be to not just leave things hanging in the air. I felt like I wanted some closure to this. And I thought that um, 
if I stopped by his house, I could shake his hand because I knew he was going to Japan. They they cut orders for him to go to Japan at light speed. Huh. And I, uh, I, I thought that that would give me some measure of peace. So I told my wife, I said, please stop by Toby's house. I'll just be a moment. And she didn't, she was reticent to do that. She's like, you know, Terry, don't mess with these OSI people. They scare me. And I said, I know they scare me too. You know, I'll be in there all of four minutes. She stopped in front of the house because they only lived a few blocks away from us and family housing. And I ran up to the door, you know, same door I'd been through a hundred times. And I did what I usually did to announce myself. And that was I, I knocked three times and I opened the door and just said, hey, guys, it's me. And I did that. And I and I walked in and shut the door behind me. And his wife, Tammy, walked past me and they were packing. They were obviously packing in the middle of a move. And I think she had a lamp in her hand is what I believe from memory. Hmm. And uh, she turned and she gave me a very hard look and said, you're not supposed to be here. And I said, Tammy, I know I, I'm not here. I'm not here for any conflict. I just want to say goodbye to you guys. Uh, and I want to wish my friend well. And um, she just kept walking. But Toby had heard our exchange and he walked around the corner from the bedroom. And he was just and I was shocked because he was just Paul. He was a train wreck. I mean, this is a guy that was always so particular about his appearance. You know, he was the guy that always had a haircut that was in regulation. He always had a, you know, starched uniform, always had his shoes shined. Mm. You know, I was kind of a slob, but he was, <laughs> he was yeah. meticulous about his appearance. And uh, when he walked around the corner, you know, his hair was all sideways. He had a growth of beard. His clothes were dirty. He was barefoot. But I thought, you know what, he's packing. I got to cut him some slack for that. Yeah. But I felt, you know, when I saw him, I didn't feel like I was seeing an old friend. I felt stunned for some reason. I felt it, it felt awkward. Hmm. And he walked right up to me and uh, is like a foot and a half in front of me. And he was he's shorter than I am. I'm six foot. He's a couple inches shorter. Hmm. And he looked up at me and, uh, oh, I held my hand out. I, I initially I thought it would be appropriate to embrace the guy, you know, yeah. give him a hug and say, you know, good luck out there, man. And, yeah, of course. Uh, but I didn't do that. I, I held my hand out, and then he held his hand out, and we didn't make contact, and we finally managed to connect and then made this inelegant handshake of sorts. And I I said, oh, man, I just, you know, I know you're going to Japan. I just want to say it's been a pleasure to work with you, a pleasure to be your friend, and I, and I just want to wish you well. Mm. And uh, he looked up at me. And his eyes were all bloodshot, and I could smell liquor on his breath. Hmm. Now, I knew this guy well, and, you know, we played cards together. We'd done, uh, you know, barbecues and socialized on our time off. And I knew him to maybe drink a can, can and a half of beer, but that was that was it. Hmm. He, was, he was not a drinker. Yeah. That wasn't beer that I smelled on his breath. That was, that was some kind of liquor. Yeah. And um, when he looked up at me, he said, it happened, didn't it, Terry? And I said, yes, my brother, it really happened. You're not losing your mind. And then he said, but why us? And um, that's, for some reason, that had a stun stunning effect on me, too. I felt just awkward, just really. And I said, man, I don't have uh, an expletive clue. Yeah. And I broke my gaze with him, looked down at my shoe for a second or two, and turned, and I ran out of the house. And I, you know, I really went there with the intention of finding some, some peace in this conversation. And I found no peace in that whatsoever. All I found in that was anxiety. So, and that's the last time I saw my friend. Uh, I did try to make contact with him. You know, in my second book, I tell the, the reckoning, I tell the, the whole story about my efforts to locate him. After I got out of the military, I, I continued my education and, uh, we moved to Michigan where I went to law school, and I had Toby's phone number, or pardon me, his father's phone number the, for the family home, and I called once, and uh, it was a few years after I got out of the military. I left in 1979, and I spoke with uh, an elderly gentleman uh, that I'm sure was his dad. Uh, he knew who I was, and I told him, I said, you know, that I, I'm just trying to reach my old friend, see how he's doing. And he said very politely, well, Toby, don't stay here. But he said, if you want, I'll leave your, your phone number and I'll have him call you next time I see him. And I said, I'd appreciate that very much. 
Uh, that's what I did, expecting to hear from my friend in a couple days or weeks, but he never did call. And then six months, eight months passed, and it was around uh, the holiday time, around Christmas. And I thought, well, I'm going to try again and uh, see if I can catch uh, this guy at home. And I called, and the number had been disconnected. So I thought, well, I don't know where to go from here. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometime later, we, my wife got a call from Toby's now ex, and she explained that um, they went to Japan. Mm -hmm. And that Toby did not do, was not, did not do well. Uh, and she explained to my wife that, yeah, Toby had a problem with alcohol. She had divorced Toby, got custody of the kids and removed, pardon me, relocated with him to the Los Angeles area. And she said, uh, my husband is a long haul truck driver. Our kids are with my parents and, uh, I'm going to ride with him on this when he takes this load and we're going to, we're going to be in your neighborhood. We're headed for Detroit. Would you guys like some company? My wife was like, yeah, we'd be, we'd love to see you guys. Yeah, mm. please. Try. So they did. I got to see Tammy again. And, uh, I was a little apprehensive about that because the last time I saw her, you know, she yes. had that, you know, a little bit of an attitude. Yeah. 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 And a lump in her hand as well, Terry. You have to be careful. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, she explained to me, she said, yeah. She said, you know, I blamed you for my husband's uh, condition mm -hmm. because he had told me, had told his wife that this camping trip was my idea, <laughs> which is not a character for him, but mm. that's, that's what she claims anyway. I believe her. Yeah. And she said that Toby had a problem with sleep, that he could not get to sleep. Mm. And it wasn't so much that he was, uh, that he would hit the pub or, or that he would drink during the day. But at night, he'd become apprehensive as the sun went down. And mm. uh, this makes sense a little bit to me. I had, I had some struggles, too, uh, I have to admit. And yeah. that is, you know, when, when you close your eyes and go to sleep, you're vulnerable. I mean, mm. that's when the monsters come in. Yeah. And uh, I still sleep with a light on. Mm. And uh, I have to have the drapes drawn. I have to have the bedroom door open. Yeah. Um, I sleep with a pair of headphones earbuds and I have a um, I listen to meditative apps or something so that I don't hear any you know noises at night that would yeah. you know frighten me mm -hmm. uh, have an alarm system and, and uh, yeah she said that the only way he could get to sleep was she would just you know two hours before bed he'd start pounding hard liquor and just pass out yeah. you know, if you do that for any length of time I mean it's going to rob you of REM sleep and uh, mm -hmm. yeah negative effects on your personality, your character. It led to his mental decline. That and, of course, whatever effect those pills had. Yeah. I meant to ask uh, Tammy if, if he took all those pills, but I, I didn't think about doing it at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was a bit awkward. We were there with her new husband. Yeah. Uh, having her, and I didn't want to dwell solely on her ex. Mm, yes, of course. But she told me that Toby returned to Flint, Michigan, where he was from originally, and his family had decided because Toby was struggling and insecure in his employment and housing that uh, they would give him after his father passed away, the house, the, the family house. Um, so they gifted that to Toby. And she said that he, um, due to his employment and security, lost the home for payment, non-payment of taxes. Hmm. So she had no idea where he resided or where he was. Yeah. And I did make another attempt to find him. Yeah. Uh, this was a few years later, and I explained this in the in the second book hmm. uh, that I was working on a case that involved the the uh, FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, hmm. uh, and I uh, I made some people upset with me because of the story, uh, and I, I want to be very clear that I'm not I don't mean to tar everyone with the same brush here. I have I have nothing but respect for law enforcement people. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, uh, and I think the FBI are, are, are very good people, uh, very professional in what they do. Uh, but I met this FBI agent, and um, we would occasionally, on a Friday night, meet at the pub and have a beer or two and just talk over the week. And um, I asked him one evening, I said, uh, hey, you know, I'm trying to find a guy I was in the uh, Air Force with. Hmm. Think you could help me find him? And he said, now this was intended to be humor. 
this is dry, dry humor, but this is FBI humor. Yeah. So, yeah, I can find anybody unless they're a fugitive, which, of course, apprehending fugitives <laughs> is what they do. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I chuckled. I pretended to laugh. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we laughed at his own joke. And uh, he yeah. said, yes, yeah, I'm happy to help you out. He said, no, look, I can't, of course, I can't open an investigation. But he said, as a favor to a friend, I'll see if I can find your buddy for you. And I said, that'd be great. And he said, do me a favor. He says, give me a picture of the guy if you have one and write down absolutely everything you know about this guy. Everything you can think of. No detail too small. Put it on a piece of paper, a couple pieces of paper for me, get it to me, and I'll see what I can do. I said, sure. I'd appreciate that very much. So I did. I followed his instructions to the letter. And um, he was busy that week. I put it in an envelope and marked personal and put his name on it. And I dropped it off at his office. And uh, about two weeks later, I got a call on a Wednesday, I believe, because he said, hey, Friday's coming. He says, uh, I got some information on your buddy. You want to meet me at the bar? And I said, sure, sure. I'm excited. I, I can't wait to hear. And he said, well, good. I'll see you there. I got to the bar and he was late getting there, which was kind of not usual for him, but he was late. And uh, he walked in and I could tell by the long face that he didn't have good news. And he sat down and he got right to the point and he said, Terry has some very bad news for you. And he said, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your friend is dead. And I said, that can't be. He's a young man. How can he be dead? And he said, well, it was an automobile accident. It was a crossover accident on a Highway 94 headed toward Detroit. He was killed instantly. And he said, now, Terry, look, you know, these things happen. You know, you've been around the block. You know, you know how how life is. And uh, mm. he said, my suggestion is that you cope with it and uh, process it and move on with your life. And I'm very sorry. Mm. And, you know, it had been... It had been so easy for me to pick up the phone and call the Michigan State Police and verify what he was telling me was true. Yeah. And I, and I didn't I didn't bother to do that because I believed him. Yeah. Yeah, you got a relationship with this guy. You'd no reason to not trust him. I, I didn't. I, I think that uh, – I don't think there was a mistake. I think he intentionally lied to me. But but I will temper that with this. I, I believe – and I, maybe I'm wrong, but this is the only thing that makes sense to me. I believe that somewhere within the federal system there's a file – you know, with Toby and Terry's name on it and something in there that says, you know, these two guys should not get together. Yeah. Uh, I spoke with uh, Robert Hastings, who wrote a book called uh, UFOs and Nukes that was very popular uh, about 10 years ago. Yeah. And for 30 years, uh, he's, he's well known in the UK, too. He, for 30 years, he studied incidents of active duty personnel on nuclear bases and their interaction with UFOs and what happens. And, uh, you know, he's talked to hundreds of veterans like myself yeah. who had experiences on, on UFO bases. In fact, he uh, he became kind of a friend. He, he's writing a foreword to my book, uh, The Reckoning, which I'm going to add to the book as a re as a new edition. Yeah. But he told me, to Terry, that's 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 normal. He said when when, you know, he said, now, there's a difference. If, if three guys are out in the field and they see a silver disc dart across the sky, you know, they'll pull them in, they'll talk to them and say, you know, well, I think what you saw was a helicopter, but whatever you saw, you know, don't talk about it. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But for people that have something a little more intimate, like, like Toby and I experienced, mm. um, the standard is within the military, you, you separate those people. Yeah. You send them off in different directions. And you know what? They wouldn't have had to do that anyway. I was a friend in the frame of mind. I didn't want anything to do with them. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it's crazy. I, I put an email address in the back of Incident at Devil's Den. Yeah. And I said, look, I'm not a therapist or a doctor, but, you know, if you've had a strange experience, write and tell me about it, and I'll, I'll return your email, and I'd be happy to hear your story. Mm -hmm. And I've had 15, over, over 1,500 people send me emails and stories. I, you know, what I did was I, I tried to categorize all these. Mm -hmm. And... On a spreadsheet, on an Excel spreadsheet, and look for commonalities. And it, what stood out pretty clearly was that if a group of people have some type of intimate encounter, and there's all kinds, that they tend to drift apart. Yeah. You know, four people see it, they'll all drift apart. Mm. Uh, there's a famous book written by Ray Fowler about, it's called The Allagash Four, about. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And you know that happened with those guys, and even the uh, Jack and Jim Weiner, who were who were uh, twin brothers, yeah, kind of drifted apart. Uh, very unusual. Mm. Um, so that's that's a common common thing. And mm. it's like say four or five family members, uh, close family members, mother, father, two children, witness something mm. at that level. Obviously, they can't disband, but what they'll do is nobody will talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's a topic that's off the table. Nobody will talk about it. And this this one gentleman told me, he says, you know, 30 years after the fact, Uncle Joe brings it up at the at the at the dinner table one night. Does anybody remember that that UFO that we saw? Mm -hmm. And he said, everybody at the table stopped eating and there was just silence. And, uh, you know, everyone's I'm done, you know, yes. got up on the table. Yeah. No one was talking about it. Yeah, I think. What struck me as well about your life as well, Terry, is that you've achieved a great deal regardless of this incident almost 50 years ago now. And yet it seems that you were battling these repressed memories. I know you, you say you were having some horrendous nightmares, maybe once or twice a year, I believe, and, and you were really struggling. Do you think your mind was trying to unlock whatever had happened to you for several years until you were able to kind of come to grips with it? You know, I do. Uh, but there was a catalyst too, mm. you know. And I, I think what the what you can do is you can suppress memories, you know, and uh, you can have them suppressed and driven down into your subconscious. Uh, yeah. uh, but I think that if you do that, that these memories are going to filter back up. They're mm. going to percolate back up into your conscious mind. Mm. You know, maybe your mind won't be able to process them. Maybe it'll maybe it'll manifest in some unhealthy way, like it did with my friend, as alcoholism or drug abuse or or um, some unhealthy aspect until you till you process it. And uh, I certainly, my wife and I, we shared that secret, but mm. we never discussed it because every time we discussed it, we knew my nightmares would ramp up and it would be unsettling to me. So we just avoided the topic. Yeah. Uh, we never told our children. We have two adult children, you know, 40 and 37. They knew dad would have screaming nightmares once or twice a year, but that that was it. They, they didn't know the, the, stoop, the back story behind it. Yeah. Yeah. What happened was I, I had an injury. I, I can't say it's an injury, really more of an illness. Hmm. And I couldn't bear weight on my right leg. Yeah. I, I retired from the state of Vermont where I was state's attorney and moved. My wife and I moved from Vermont to Dallas to be near our adult children and grandchildren. That was in January of 2012. Hmm. Well, about 10 months later, I got up one morning and I couldn't bear weight on my right leg. Yeah. And I told my wife, I said, I'm going to have to go to the hospital. Will you, will you take me? I get all my medical care from the VA. Mm, yeah. so she took me and um, I saw a very polite, um, seemed to know what she's doing, a uh, physician's assistant. And she sent me to get an x-ray. And the x-ray technician took a couple views of my leg, my right leg, kind of from head on and then kind of at a side angle with my leg bent. And she said, uh, you know, Mr. Lovelace, were you ever, uh, did you ever suffer a shrapnel wound or something that could account for this, looks like a piece of metal in your leg or a wire? I said, no, I, I mean, other than a skinned knee as a kid, I've never injured that leg. Mm. And she took a bunch more films and uh, she said, well, you have a couple of anomalies here that I'd like, uh, I'd like the radiologist to look at before you leave. Mm. Um, and unless it was an emergency, and of course this was no emergency, um, the, the, the routine is to throw the x-ray into a stack and then they're read kind of at the radiologist leisure and yeah. he'll write a, he or she'll write a report. And uh, um, so the radiologist was annoyed that he was asked to come down. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I could tell when he walked into the room with his cup of coffee, he wasn't happy. And um, <laughs> he went over and he looked at my first x-ray and he came over and said, well, you're going to have a scar right here. And he poked me in the leg. And I said, I don't I don't have a scar there, sir. And he says, well, you see uh, this X-ray. And uh, he popped it up on the view box. And, you know, I in 79, when I got out of the military, I, I started to pack on weight um, because I wasn't active. I wasn't running an ambulance anymore. I was, you know, spend most of my time at studying. And. Um, you know, I started running mm. uh, way to control my weight, and I ran for the next 40 years. I, I, I enjoyed running. Yeah. Um, and uh, 
But I noticed that every time I would run, there's a connection here to the story. Every time I would run, there was a spot on my knee or just above my knee and lateral yeah. that would go completely numb as soon as I hit the two mile mark. I mean, give or take 50 yards. But when I hit that two mile mark in my run, that spot would go numb. Yeah. And, and I could take a pin and I could trace out, I could delineate the edges of it. Mm. And it was perfectly round and about uh, a little over an inch in diameter. I, I, I didn't understand that. And I asked my doctor, you know, 1980 or so, I, when I run, I get this numb spot in my leg at about the two mile mark. And, you know, it, it gets numb and kind of itchy. And then when I finish my run, it's gone in about 30 minutes. Mm. And she told me, says, you know, it sounds like a histemic reaction to me. Um, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. If it doesn't interfere with your run, I don't think there's no harm in it. Yeah. So, you know, I never gave it a second thought. But when I saw that x-ray, I realized that this thing that I'm looking at in my leg that looks like a piece of electronics device lay directly underneath that spot would, that would go numb. Um, mm. And when I saw that, I just... Um, well, it it was frightening because it, it was validation that these things had put their hands on me. Mm. And the doctor said, you know, the doctor insisted on examining my leg and he couldn't find a scar. There is no scar. Yeah. And I asked him, I said, doctor, how often is it that you find a foreign object in the body, you know, at this size, this depth, and there not be a corresponding scar? And he was obviously uh, confounded by it. He said, never. He said, I've been a radiologist for 23 years. I've never seen this before. He says, it's not possible to violate the integrity of the skin and have this object buried in your fascia and there not be a corresponding scar. It just doesn't make sense. So Goodness. They do account for it being there. Yeah. As you refer to, Terry, when you released the first book, you put an, an email address in and, and people from all around the world have got in touch with you about their personal experiences. Have you found it cathartic to be able to speak with these people? Because obviously it's been, I would imagine, because having to deal with the ramifications of what happened and not having a clear memory for, for several years, I imagine, and, and just getting flashes in dreams or whatever. How have you found it? I mean, has it, has it allowed you to try and f come to peace with it a little bit? Feel a bit more relaxed about what happened to you? Or do you, do you still feel emotionally drained about that event, primarily because of everything that went off, the loss of your best friend, um, the, the situation with your, your career, the the weird things that went on in the immediate days after this yeah. uh, this thing. Um, how has it made you feel to realise that you are not the only person that has gone through this and there are other people that have perhaps been suffering in silence for decades? It has brought me a great deal of peace. Good. Um, I really had no clue. I really had no idea that there are so many people out there that have had these experiences you know, I got so many letters from people. I got letters from people, and there, there's just, you know, I look for commonalities when I'm evaluating things like this. Mm. And um, out of the 1500, there's a core group, uh, and I don't mean to, I don't mean to judge anyone's experience. Every experience is valid, but there's a core group of about 400 that are just articulately stated and um, provide a lot of detail and are just very, very belie believable folks. Yeah. And, you know, they, they always start, it's, it's interesting, the first paragraph of every email I get starts off with, please don't think I'm crazy, yes. I know <laughs> I know you're going to think I'm nuts, I, you know, I, yeah. I know this sounds outrageous. Um, so they have this apologetic first paragraph, and then they tell me the most amazing stories. Mm. And... Um, and it's been it's been wonderful because I realized that yeah I'm not alone I'm not the only one um, there's nothing unique about me yeah, yeah. and it, it's a good feeling to get a hold of these people and, and say because most of them say you know I've never told a soul about this a yeah. lot of people tell me that reading my book brought this especially childhood events brought their childhood events to the forefront of their memory hmm. we can kind of share stories and exchange that yeah you're not alone and uh, yeah you know. Yeah. Strength in numbers, Terry, no doubt. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think the last aspect I'll touch on as well is um, Devil's Den is notable, I think, as well, because it's it's one of those areas in the in the US that's got a reputation for strange things, Terry. And there's always been a case that I've often been mystified by. And I think I'm, I'm not sure if you mentioned it in an interview I heard you, you, you undergo a couple of years ago. 
which was the disappearance of a, of a young girl called Catherine Van Alst. And which is one of those remarkable stories that the more you look at it, the stranger it is. Because was she six years old or something and she just disappeared on a, on a camping trip and, and went miles away? You know, when I was, I, w I did research for this book in yeah. 2017 and I said, you know, it occurred to me that um, this place has the name Devil. Yes. It's a demonic connotation. It's a negative connotation. Mm. And I thought, you know, somewhere this place had to earn that name somehow. Yeah, absolutely. And I started doing my research and uh, I found that, that that area of land was claimed by two Native American tribes, mm. uh, the Hino and the Kato tribe. Mm. And I tracked down in Russellville, Arkansas, a woman who told me that uh, she's a, a, a shaman, a, a uh, medicine doctor uh, yeah. for the tribe. Mm. I reached out to her by phone. She told me, "Yeah, that's you know, I'm." I verified her that she was a member of the tribe, that she was that was her position. And uh, I said, "Well, you know, I'm hoping that you can help me." I had a bizarre uh, encounter, you know, uh, years ago, 1977. You know, this was 2017. Mm. In 1977. In Devil's Den, and I'm just curious, I know that your people lay claim to at least half of that area. May I ask, what is what is the history of Devil's Den uh, for your people? And she says, well, it's cursed ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I said, well, how do you know that it's cursed ground? And she says, it's, it's oral tradition. It's been handed down for as long as anybody can remember. Yeah. But she says, we don't, we don't, it's a place that we transit through. We'll walk across it. Uh, but we won't stop, we won't camp, we won't fish or hunt there. We transition through it only, or transit through it only. Mm. Um, and that was kind of shocking to me. So I, I thought the next step would be that I'd want to uh, get a hold of an archaeologist and find out a little about Native American people that, you know, lived there, who who was there in, you know, hundreds or thousands of years ago. Yeah. So through a friend at Michigan State University, uh, I got a hold of a, an archaeologist, uh, actually a couple that practice archaeology, who told me that all around Devil's Den, they find uh, native artifacts, you know, going back to Neolithic times, you mm. know, as far as nine, eight or nine thousand years. Mm. But they also find Native American uh, flint stone tools, uh, old campsites where they find burned charcoal and the like. Yeah. Um, evidence that they'd flake these tools from Flint. And he said, we find them all around Devil's Den. But he said, we've made several uh, excavations in Devil's Den, and there are some caves there in particular that we were interested in. And he said, we've never found one bit of evidence of human habitation um, huh. within the confines of the park. Mm. So that was a bit upsetting. Yeah. And then I ran across Catherine Van Ost. I found the story... Uh, on the internet in a 1946 um, edition of the Pittsburgh Press from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And Catherine and her two younger brothers and her parents, um, post immediately post-World War II, there was a camping craze in the United States. Yeah. And people were buying these pull-behind campers and, and, you know, spending time out of doors. And uh, yeah. so they were part of that craze, and they bought a camper – Mom, dad, two brothers, and, and Catherine uh, all made the trip. They were traveling from Pittsburgh, headed toward El Paso, Texas, and Devil's Den was right in the right in their path. Hmm. So they they spent the night there, yeah. uh, and they intended to spend two nights there and kind of visit the park and and look around. And uh, on the first morning after their first night's sleep, uh, the mother is uh, putting. And it's not clear the time, but I know that it's morning. Mother is putting breakfast on the table, and the kids are supposedly running around this camper. And the two boys pop out, and she's kind of had her eye on them, as we do with our kids. Mm -hmm. Catherine didn't pop out. And the boys are looking like, where's Catherine at? Mm -hmm. And you know, mom chimes in and says, boys, where's your sister? And they say, well, she was right here. So she walks over, and she, there's no Catherine. And there's nowhere else she could have gone. Um you know, they're, they're at a campsite. Had she wandered off in any direction, they would have seen her. And the boys maintained that, they, that she was right in back of them. Uh, Mom said to the boys, go check the restrooms and look for your sister, thinking that that's, that's what happened. It's an easy, easy uh, thing to miss, 
construe and huh. boys come back and they're like, we can't find her. So they wake up dad. Dad gets up. Uh, he's, he's alarmed. He gets some campers involved to help them look for her and to help look for her. And uh, the area outside the uh, the campgrounds is kind of rough terrain. It's rocky. You know, she is wearing a bathing suit and shower thongs. Yeah. And that's all she's wearing. And uh, they couldn't find her. So by noon, they had the uh, park rangers from Devil's Den State Park involved. And then there's an adjacent park on the other side of the highway there that's uh, called the Ozark National Forest. Um, that's a federal uh, campground. And they had uh, volunteer searchers from both. And eventually there was, uh, you know, flights from the Little Rock, Arkansas Civil Air Patrol over the area looking for her. Hmm. It's just thousands of acres, but they had 2,500 um, searchers at one point. They, uh, college, the Arkansas State University, busted in a bunch of kids yeah. to um, to help look for this little girl. And it was supposed to last seven days. And on the seventh, at the end of the seventh day, it would transition from a rescue to a recovery. Yeah. Meaning that, you know, they would look for her remains instead of her yeah. and uh, scale back, scale back, uh, radically scale back the, the hunt. Huh. And on that seventh day, there was a young man. His name is Porter Chadwick. I tried to find him. Unique name. You'd think I'd been able to find him. I couldn't find him. Anyway, Porter Chadwick was a volunteer from Arkansas State University, and he was several miles from the campsite. And there's a limestone bluff with a winding trail that goes zigzag uh, because it's too steep to climb otherwise. Hmm. And he navigated up this um, the steep steep cliff, and he's at an elevation of about 600 some feet above the campgrounds where Catherine was was last seen, yeah. and again some miles away. And this is an area that had already been searched twice, and but he's doing his due diligence, and he walks through, and he's yelling, Catherine. And this little girl popped out from a limestone overhang, and she said, here I am. And he was emotional, and he went over and snatched her up, and he said, my God, are you okay? And she says, yeah, I'm fine. And he says, "Hun, where have you been? And she says, I don't know. I woke up here this morning, and I thought I'd just wait for you to come get me. <laughs> Take me back to Mom. Yeah. And they took the little girl back. And there's there's some comments that were made. Uh, there's also an article in the Kansas City Star that has a, a photograph of her. Mm -hmm. And uh, her and her dad, or no, her and Porter Chadwick. Yeah. The rest, and I did some research. Mom was quoted as saying that other than a few bug bites on her legs, she was no worse for the wear. Mm -hmm. uh, she had no injuries of any kind. She said that her smell, pardon me, her hair still smelled clean because it had been shampooed when she showered the night before. Yeah. And she said that her little girl hadn't lost an ounce of weight and was 100% hydrated, and there was no potable water anywhere on top of that that, that cliff she was found. Mm. So how she could be well hydrated is anybody's guess. Yeah. But it's a mystery. Yeah, because I know they, they presumed, I remember, because I, I saw a, uh, a news clipping from, from just, I think, a couple of days after she'd been found, Terry, and they were saying, oh, well, she... We think she survived on berries and drinking water from pools. Yeah. No, where they found her, there were no pools. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's just a very strange area. So, I mean, it's it just got that history to it, doesn't it? And it just seems that for whatever reason, on that particular night, you and you and Toby were there. Terry, something paid you a visit and, and changed your life forever, my friend. It did. It did. So what's next for you then, Terry? I know you've, um, like I say, you've recently... We released a, a, a second book, Devil's Den, The Wrecking, um, which which includes some of the correspondence you received, I believe, after the the first book and and some of the stories that you were that you were shared uh, from from people around the world. Okay. So, what's next for you, and and uh, where do you think this this journey is going to take you next? Well, you know, I want to continue to uh, I speak at UFO conferences, hmm. and. Um, that's very therapeutic for me, and I, and I enjoy that, and I mm -hmm. do that as often as I can. So, um, matter of fact, I, I haven't been to a conference in a year because of the, the yeah. threat of the virus, of course. Uh -huh. But uh, March 20th, I'm going to go to a conference in Sedona, Arizona. It's held outside. Mm. Go there and, and, and speak. 
it'll it'll be nice to be back in that. Uh, you know, I'll take all the precautions necessary. I've had my first vaccine. I'm waiting on my second dose to come up here shortly. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go fly down there and and, uh, and talk to people because I enjoy that and I miss it. Yeah. Yeah. I am working on a third book, but that that'll be a little bit of a little bit of time. Yeah. Nothing to do with UFOs uh, this time. I'm writing a book about the afterlife. Hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Intriguing. Intriguing. So where can everybody keep up to date with your work, Terry, and and, and get hold of a copy of your your two marvelous books? Yes. Um, you can go to uh, terrylovelace.com, and uh, that's my ill-maintained website. <laughs> that I look at. But there's some marvelous photographs and drawings on there. My X-rays are on there. Yeah. Uh, for folks that like to see them. Mm-hmm. Uh, my books are for sale only on Amazon. Yeah. So, you know, go to Amazon. Um, I guess it's Amazon.uk. Yep. Yeah. And uh, and look under Devil's Den and you'll find them there. The Incident at Devil's Den and Devil's Den, The Reckoning uh, are both there. I'm pleased to say both were number one bestsellers. Mm. I, you know, I hope that you enjoy them. And my email is in there if you... If you have any questions, if there's anything I can help you with or questions I can answer, you're more than welcome to uh, email me. I return every single email. Fantastic. Well, Terry, it's a remarkable story and you are a remarkable man to have achieved what you've achieved regardless of of this incident. And um, it's been a real privilege to finally have a chance to speak with you. You, Like I said at the beginning of our conversation, you're somebody I've been aware of for two or three years. And... um, I've always been fascinated by your experience and what happened to you and how you've dealt with it in in such a positive way. So thank you for your time and your conversation. It's been a real privilege. And you take care and enjoy that conference. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. You take care, too.